Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. Are you ready? Do you have your Bible? Read it. If you don't have one, share with your neighbor. It's perfectly okay. I understand. Here we go. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that make atonement for your soul. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. So the, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Amen? Amen. All right. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. Here we go. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, how? Through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Now there's a covenant that supersedes every other covenant. It's God made a covenant with himself before the foundation of the world. And the covenant that he made, and a covenant requires a couple of things. It requires two, at least two, two parties. It requires agreement of the covenant, covenant, the, the, the covenant uh, terms of the uh, covenant. And it also requires an exchange. For example, in the old, old way, if we made a covenant with somebody, everything that I have is yours and everything they have is mine. They didn't hold anything back which means we're in this thing together. And it wasn't a covenant that was, had a term. It was a covenant that was everlasting. When people get married in the church, we love wed weddings and their ceremonies, but we really love marriages. So when a couple comes in to give a covenant, they, they take covenant, a bride and, and, a, and a, uh, the, the groom come together and they make a covenant in front of witnesses that they're making a covenant that's not just has a term. It's more than a contract. It's a covenant. It's, it's, it has the beginning when the terms are created, and it has no end. That's called an everlasting covenant. God made an everlasting covenant with us through the blood of Jesus Christ because Jesus is the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundations of the world. So long before there was an Adam... There was a covenant that was everlasting. So God made a covenant outside of time with us through the blood of the Lamb, an everlasting one with no beginning and no end. But then he comes down and backs up time and starts this thing with Adam. And here's what he did. He forms man, Adam. Adam means ruddy or clay man. He, he forms a, a man out of the dirt. He has a, has a body. He has blood in his body, but he also breathed life in him. When he breathed life in him, the breath that came from heaven gave power to the blood. Okay? When Adam transgressed, his blood was still in his body, but the breath that came from heaven was withdrawn. So now Adam lives in a body with the blood, but doesn't have the breath from heaven that sustains the life in that blood. Okay? So now we have Adam that has fallen. Everything within itself reproduces after its own kind. The seed is in itself. So now Adam and Eve were supposed to reproduce with the blood they had inside of them, but the breath that came from heaven that gave it supernatural life. And Adam was supposed to reproduce after that kind. When he fell, sin, transgressed, everything he now reproduced was reproducing with blood, but it was not with the breath from heaven that gave it the connection of eternal life. So God makes a covenant with Adam, an Adamic covenant. He made it. But that covenant was not an everlasting covenant. It was a covenant within time. It was a covenant that God made with Adam based on the terms that Adam and God made. It was made on, uh, uh, here's my agreement, here's your agreement. It requires you to do some things and me to do some things, and together we'll do some things, but it's going to require your effort to be able to do this. But Adam was reproducing sons and daughters after his own kind, which was fallen from a place of disconnect and a place that he still had blood in this body, right? But the blood he had in his body 
didn't have the breath from heaven that was breathing on that body that, that gave it life yeah. eternal. So that man means man became terminal. Term. He began decaying from that moment on. So he has a covenant with Adam. Then God brings up Noah, and God makes a covenant with Noah. I'll never destroy the earth again with water. This is my rainbow. As long as you're doing this, Noah, I'm going to be doing this. Another covenant. Covenant had the term. It was in life, in this, this, this life we're living. So he had Adam covenant. He had Noah covenant. Then he makes a covenant with Moses. So we see from the very beginning of time, after Moses had, or after Adam had fallen, there was a series of covenant that God made with man. And they had a beginning time and they had an ending time. Because any time man is responsible to sustain the covenant, man has already proven we can't sustain it. Any time it's up to us to fulfill our end of the bargain with God, God will always fulfill his end of the bargain, but man will always come short. Always. But God made a provision before he even made a covenant with Adam. And his provision was, I'm going to make an everlasting covenant with you before the foundations of the world. I'm going to make a covenant with myself and make you the beneficiary of it. Right? So Leviticus comes forward after Moses. After there's Adam, there's Noah, there's Moses, Abrahamic covenant, all these wonderful covenants with men. But all of the covenants were with God and man. But man could never end up to their, live up to their end of the bargain. So we were always coming up short. So one day, God says this. He says, after 4,000 years of making covenant with man, if the fullness of time has now come, and I'm going to bring forth that covenant that happened before the, everla- before the foundations of the world. So now in the fullness of time, time had become full. All these covenants had been made with man that man had never kept. God himself now comes down in the form of Christ to Jesus, the man, and now God is going to display in front of all mankind, not only all mankind, but principalities and powers of the air, everybody that had tried to keep the commandments and keep, keep the, the covenants with, with, with God, he was going to make all that happen. He was going to come down and display and make an open show of what took place before the foundation of the world. So Jesus himself comes down and begins to talk about, I've got to shed my blood. Now, here's the thing. When God overshadowed Mary, Mary was a virgin. Joseph was not his earthly father. Because Joseph was from the same lineage that had come down through Adam. So the blood had to come from heaven or it would not have the breath of God in it. And it would have still been contaminated just like everybody else that had been born through a womb. Make sense? So God overshadows Mary, and when he overshadowed Mary, she became impregnated, but the, the, the blood, it wasn't that it was just this physical blood. She, she had physical blood. Jesus was born with physical blood, but what made his blood different than every, everybody's blood in the previous 4,000 years was his had the breath of heaven in his blood. It was God's breath itself in Jesus' blood. The same thing Adam had before he fell. Adam was perfect in all of his ways. But when he transgressed, he didn't lose his physical blood. He lost the breath of heaven that gave the life to that blood. His his immortality became mortality. His incorruption became corruption. But he was still in the man's body. Are you following me? Jesus gets born from this womb of Mary, grows up. He's just like you and I. I don't know if we've ever thought about it, but Jesus had to cut teeth just like a baby cuts teeth. He had, to, he had no teeth when he was born. He, didn't, he wasn't born an adult in that baby, in that womb. Have you ever thought about Jesus having to learn to walk? He had to learn to talk? He had to cut teeth just like everybody else, that every baby does? I mean, he, he, had to, he had to have his diaper changed. It wasn't like he was born this, this thing. Even though he was pure and holy, he had the breath of heaven running through his veins and his blood. That's what separated himself from every other person in the past. So as Jesus was raising up and becoming an adult, he was unlike Adam, where Adam had sinned. Jesus says, I'm not going to sin. So he became sinless, and as he was, not become sinless, he was sinless, but because he was sinless, 
the breath from heaven that flows through his veins in the blood gave him access to everything that was in heaven. As man was cut off for 4,000 years, Jesus now is coming as the lamb. Now, here's what it said in Leviticus. The life of the flesh is in the blood. But if the blood doesn't have the breath from heaven on the blood, you have terminal, corruptible, mortal beings trying to live in a covenant that God made with Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, and everybody else, David, and everybody else in between. But Jesus comes down and says, here's the deal. I'm not going to show you a covenant with man, even though I'm man. I'm going to make a covenant with what you have already seen and heard. This covenant is not going to be from 4,000 B.C. to 2,000 B.C. This covenant is going to be a covenant that's everlasting. This covenant gives you access to everything that's in heaven that mankind had been trying to get into heaven. God comes, Jesus starts telling about the blood of Jesus. I got to shed the blood, the blood, the blood. And you start hearing, we sing this song all the time, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What does that mean? Is it the physical blood that drained from his body that made his blood different than Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Was it his blood that was dropping? Was his blood special? Was there special DNA in his blood? What was it that made him different? Why was his blood that was shed capable and powerful enough to secure an everlasting covenant, but mankind in before, no blood of goats, no blood of rams, no blood of lambs was going to be good enough. None, only one man, sinless, blameless, came 2,000 years ago to shed his blood. Why? Because when he shed his blood, he secured a covenant with mankind that played out in time what had already happened before the foundations of the world, right? So when Jesus comes and dies on the cross and his blood is shed, when he's in Gethsemane and, the, and great drops of blood, sweat is great drops of blood, all that blood, when he, his blood came out of his pores, the chastisement of his peace was upon you, okay, on him. The, 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 by his stripes you are healed. Why does his blood on his body make it worthwhile that causes you to tap into something that you can sing nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's not because Jesus was just a, another Adam. It was because his blood originated from heaven, not from the earth. Not his physical, it's, I'm not talking about A positive or O positive or B plus, I'm not talking about his blood type. I'm talking about what was it that caused his blood to have the power to secure an everlasting covenant. And what it was, it was the breath of God breathing in his body that caused his body to have incorruptible, immortal blood that gave sustaining ability for the power of the covenant to be secured in our life. That's the difference between his blood and our blood. Here's what happened. So Jesus gets ready to die on the cross and he actually dies on the cross. Let me just skip to that point. He dies on the cross. He ascends before he, or he descends before he ascends. He goes down to the belly of hell, right? His blood had already been shed on the cross. It had been shed all the way to the cross. It had shed in Gethsemane. It had shed in front of Caiaphas when they were pulling on his beard and beating him, smacking him around, and his face was, visage was marred. Nobody could recognize him. All the blood was shed on the way to the cross, but once the death came, here's what happened. It wasn't the blood that secured that covenant because he was a man. It was the breath on the blood that secured the covenant. That's why when Jesus was on the cross, he gave up the ghost. When he gave up the breath, he gave it to the Father. He secured everything that was down here contaminated. What made him the ability to do that was the breath that he gave up was given to him by the Father not by Joseph. Are you following me? Are you tracking? This is important. Because when he dies on the cross, the Bible said he had to go ascend to heaven. But first, without ascending, he had to descend. So he goes to hell. He goes to the, 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 the belly of hell. And, he, and to Abraham's bosom is what it was called. It was a place where everybody 
up to Jesus, had died and went to sleep and was hell. And here's what happened. He goes, preaches himself to the people in hell. He goes to Adam and he said, Adam, I'm the tree of life. Adam, if you can believe the gospel, I'm bringing you out of here. Noah, I'm the ark. I, you are pointing to me. Abraham, I, I'm the one that was the, la- the ram that was caught in the thicket, but I'm also the son that was there ready to be slain. That was me. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, he goes to Moses. Moses, I'm the law. It's fulfilled in me. He goes through and begins to preach to all the people that are in captivity in hell. These are people that are descendants of Adam, that had come through Adam in a contaminated, breathless, lifeless blood. His blood was contaminated because it did not have the breath from heaven. It it did not have it, so nothing they could do. So he comes down, and he begins to preach to them and say, Adam, I'm the one. And he says, your covenant had an end. Know what? Your covenant had an end. Abraham, your covenant, I'm sorry, you couldn't, you couldn't keep it. Your covenant only brought it to the place where in the fullness of time, I come and I bring forth an uncontaminated bloodline because I'm going to give birth out of me because as Adam reproduced after his kind, I'm going to reproduce after my kind. Are you tracking? So when he goes to hell, Abraham's bosom, and brings everybody out, he brings them out. Then he goes and he runs in the resurrection, and people on that day of the resurrection saw people from old walking the streets. How did that happen? Because when the resurrection took place, because he is the resurrection, he brought forth and led everybody that was out of captivity, he brought them out bringing them into an everlasting covenant that superseded every other covenant that was made with mankind. Are you tracking? So as he begins to bring people out, he runs into a woman, and the woman gets ready to touch him. Do you remember? And she said, he said, don't touch me yet. I have not ascended to my father. Why did he have to ascend to the father? Because from the beginning of the world, the beginning of time, Lucifer had contaminated the heavenly sanctuary with his rebellion. He was cast down to the earth and the heaven was not the same in time. Are you, are you tracking? So heaven was still not the fullness of what it needed to be because of Lucifer's, Lucifer's fall, Lucifer's, Lucifer's contamination. He was the one that led praise and worship. He was the one that worship and praise came from. And God himself said, Because he fell, he said, I will find a people, I will raise up a people that have an everlasting covenant that will take your place in the worship arena. They will worship me not because they have to. They will worship me because they can. They will have a choice to worship me, and I'm going to overshadow them with so much goodness in their life that my goodness will draw them to me, and they will sing and worship to me a song that cannot be sung by anybody else in the history of mankind. It, it'll, be, it'll, it'll precede Adam. All the principalities and the powers of the air will see this. And I'm going to make an open display of everybody. And I'm going to go down first. And I'm going to descend, lower myself, bring them out. And I'm going to preach them the gospel. The gospel of the everlasting covenant. Because my blood was shed, Jesus said. And my blood is the life of the flesh. And because what makes my blood different than every, everybody, everybody else's blood is that my blood has the breath of heaven in it. I'm the only one, Jesus said, that can go in the portals of heaven, pass through all of the sanctuary processes, and lay my blood on the altar in heaven, and I will purify heaven just like I purify the earth and like I purified the people that are in hell. My covenant will bypass all other covenants. So he began to tell them about what they've done so he could show them what he has done. So for 2,000 years... We have been walking around trying to fulfill a covenant that God made with a man in the old covenant. And we sing songs like, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Do you remember when Jesus was resurrected and he was showing himself to the disciples? And the disciples came to him and he went, he blew his breath into them. 
Why did he blow his, blow his breath into them? They were born again, redeemed, but they only could be redeemed by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. When he breathed life into them, the breath of God into them, the breath was their confirmation or consummation of their born again experience that made their life, their blood, not mortal, not corruptible, but because his blood flows through their veins, it's immortality and incorruptible. You take on a heavenly covenant when you know what your covenant says about you in heaven. So you don't fear death and you don't fear the loss because you only pass from here to there because your covenant supersedes time. Our covenant supersedes moments. Our covenant is an everlasting covenant, a covenant that cannot be taken away because he didn't make this covenant with you. He made it with himself. And because we believe in that covenant and we believe in him, we become not born of Adam, born of God. When you become born again, you no longer have Adam's blood flowing through your veins. You've got Christ's blood flowing through your veins, which is literal blood with, with the breath of heaven. So when Jesus penetrated and blew open heaven, put the blood of the, of the, on the mercy seat, in the old covenant under Adam, the, 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 the seat was a judgment seat. But when Jesus takes it to heaven, it becomes a mercy seat. Are you following me? Everything corruptible has to die. Everything incorruptible in Christ has to live. Everything he did produces fruit after its own kind. That's why he looks over his word to perform it. It's not on you. It's on him. Are you, are you tracking with me? This is critical. The church has been so blinded. We're singing songs about stuff we don't even know. The blood of Jesus set me free. Nothing but the blood. There's power in the blood. Man, all those songs are wonderful. And they get people running in the church and screaming in the church. But do you know what that means? Do you really have a reality, an actual evidence in your life that, 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 that demonstrates your belief in the power of the blood. The reason the church don't sing the blood songs anymore, and we sing a lot of worship songs, but we don't sing a lot of the blood songs, and we don't preach a lot about the blood, because we don't know much about the blood. We're ignorant on it. We, when's the last time you heard a message on, a, on the blood? It's always about the blood. We sing it, we say it, we, sh we, sh we, we, we shout it, but do you know what it means? Listen, when Christ, by the power of the Spirit, overshadowed you, you become Mary. Heavenly breath comes into your life and you become born again. When you become born again, you transcend earthly blood only that your earthly blood becomes heavenly blood. You have the breath of heaven flowing through your veins. Now that that becomes a reality to you, when you see Jesus by his stripes that I'm healed, it has a whole different connotation. It has a different meaning. When I know the crown of thorns were put upon his head and his brow and he began to bleed, everything when Jesus bled was the renewing and the rebirthing that took the curse of mankind that was on mankind off of us and he put it upon himself. But he just didn't put the curse on himself when he died with the blood shedding. He took the blood, put it in heaven, sent back the blood by the power of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. When that happened, it gave a resurrection life into you. So we're no longer trying to get out of a mess that Adam got us into. We're now living into the blessing that Christ got us through. Are you, are you hearing... We're not getting out of our jam. We're not trying to just get out of the hole. When you become born again, you're out of the hole. 
and you're starting fresh with not trying to do good again or do better the next time, you have a whole new bl bloodline. You're connected to a whole different life support. You no longer have a covenant that can have an ending. You have an everlasting covenant with God himself that God made with himself that can't be broken. It cannot be broken. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? It's incapable of breaking his own covenant. He's not a man that he should lie. He never would break his covenant. He cannot break his covenant. His covenant is everlasting. It superseded Adam's fall. And it superseded your fall. And it outlasts your next fall. When you begin to have faith in his covenant and not think it's just a contract, you'll understand that it was sealed by the blood of Jesus. And it wasn't just blood of, that's why blood of rams and goats and lambs wasn't good enough. This blood that was shed had to be shed that had heaven's breath blowing on that, on, that, on that blood. That's why only Jesus could do it. Now, we've got a whole generation of people that have no idea what I just said. Not a clue. Lost. All we do is we have to preach messages and we tailor the messages to help you get through your problems. And we go through tomorrow. We're like, God, if I could just get my head above water. What I'm trying to tell you is I'm getting to the root of the issue, not just the fruit of your problem. And we've got to get to the root or we're always going to be dealing with the fruit. And if I can change your root, I'll change your fruit. Amen. Because you have the ability to produce after its own kind. And if you only focus on your bad Adam, you'll never know who you are in Christ. If you're constantly trying to peel the layers of your flesh off, you'll always be trying to do better and do better and do better. And it's going to be your willpower that's going to make it all right. But as long as you realize you've got to put your willpower down and take on his willpower, because when Gethsemane, when he died, when he was wailing in that garden, his emotional distress was your emotional distress. Because your mind and your will and your emotions were dealt with in that garden. So you don't have to do what he did. He did what you can't do. And the question is going to be, is how much are we going to rely on his covenant with himself? Or how much is it going to be on you to keep one of those covenants that have already been made in the past that have a time, a date, and a stamp? we got too many people in the body of Christ today. We can't even, we can't even preach messages that are relevant and revelation in the church anymore because we have people that are so shallow. They're shallow as Steph calls it the kiddie pool. They're shallow. That's not us in here. We're not shallow. We got to grow. We got to get into the deep waters. We got to start understanding what this thing is all about. See, the, I'm telling you, I said it this morning, there's a gulf and a gap that's getting wider. The hot are getting hotter. The cold are getting colder. The, the, have you ever heard the wealth are getting wealthier and the rich are getting richer? That applies to the revelation too. The people that are rich in revelation are getting more revelation. The people that are poor in revelation are getting less revelation because they're still toiling in their own stuff. I'm telling you, every problem that mankind is facing is a human problem. Every solution is a heavenly solution. And the more we focus on Adam's issues, we're going to try to fix Adam with an impure bloodline rather than try to connect to heaven and let the breath of heaven flow through our bloodline and it begins to purge out stuff in your life that you can't do for yourself. It begins to wipe away what can wash away my sins, nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's his blood. It's his blood. It's his blood. It's the life of the flesh. Listen, it said the flesh. Your life and my flesh in this body. We can live from heaven's perspective. Heaven's ability. Heaven's power in this flesh. Not by Adam's blood. By the blood of Jesus. So how does this apply to me? How can this be just not a theory and a concept? You've got to be born again. And when you become born again, you take on an entirely different identity because you're not just ascribing to the Elks Club 
or the Moose Club or the VFW or one of these other rotaries. It's not about that. Something literally happens inside of you. The term that has a beginning and the end on this earth gets invaded with heaven. Heaven has no beginning and no end. So the everlasting covenant comes in and quickens your mortal body. And you become a brand new creature, a brand new species that never existed before Jesus. He didn't come to make Adam better. He came to put an end to Adam to launch his race. And his race has no beginning and has no end. It doesn't have a covenant made with man, it has a covenant made with God and himself. So how does that work in my life? You have to begin to believe you're not who you once were. That has to become a reality to you. You're not who you once were. When he invaded your life, you became born again. He gave the covenant, the, pro, the, pro, the covenant came to Abram, the promise was coming to Abraham. When you want to fulfill and experience the promises of God, you have to take the covenant in your current state. The old man hears and receives the covenant. You become brand new. When you become brand new, you begin to sever the things that resemble the old. You cut them off. You don't think like you used to think. You don't hang like you used to hang. You don't do like you used to do. You don't toy like you used to toy. You don't play like you used to play. Very practical things. Why? Because you have heaven's blood flowing through your veins. See, if you had to do it in willpower, more power to you. But you have supernatural power that destroys the yoke of bondage in your life. So when you pray for somebody that's sick, if you're praying them Adam to Adam, it isn't gonna work. But if you're praying from heaven to Adam, it brings forth manifest healing. Why? Because the blood of Jesus is powerful, more powerful than anything in this world. Are you following what I'm saying? I want you to get this. This is, this is the piece of the church that we're, we're lacking. We can't sing the songs and not know what we're, we're singing. See, the, the world problems are going to get worse. More people are going to get addicted. We can, try, we can fight all that we want to. We can put programs in place and we can, we can, we can harness Adam the best we can. But Adam has to die Amen. so that Christ can live. And if Adam dies, corruptibility dies and incorruptible lives. Mortality goes and immortality rises. The blood that absent of heavenly breath goes and heavenly breath on the blood of Jesus lives on. Who are you going to ascribe to? Who are you going to identify with? Are you identifying with the flesh trying to do better? Or are you going to identify with him that has already done better? And it's, it's, a, it's a matter of making an adjustment in your life of who you're going to follow. It's not difficult. It's not hard. We're making it too hard, making it too difficult. And we're preaching, we, we are the best at self-help than we've ever been. And the church has got the self, best self-help books that are out there. We've made the Bible a self-help book. It's become moral relativism or humanism. Do better. Come on, rededicate. You backslid, you rededicate. Man, he made a covenant with you, whether you like it or not. He didn't call you on the phone to say, I'm dying for you. I'm dying for you. Now what are you going to do about it? How are you going to incorporate what he did in your life as a truth that you live through? And what doesn't line up with what you see, you cut it out of your life. It's not rocket science. He didn't make it that hard. He just said to the disciples, hey, come follow me. I'll make you. I'll take you from where you are, something you're not. And if you follow me, I'll make you something that you really, really desire to be. And you won't even be able to recognize yourself from where you were if you follow me. That means you're going to have to let some stuff go in the back. 
Cut some stuff off. What you used to enjoy, you may not be able to enjoy anymore. What you used to surround yourself, you're not surrounding yourself anymore. What? But man, that's hard to do. Yes, it is hard to do, Adam. But if you sow into Adam, you reap Adam's results. If you sow into the kingdom, you reap kingdom results. Amen? Stand to your feet with me. Rocky, come on up here. Here. Close this out. Yeah. I don't know uh, how you follow that. That's, uh, I think what he said was um, in, in Luke 4... Jesus opens up the book of Isaiah and he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he anointed me to bring the good news. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what we need to recognize and look at today. The good news was to bind up and heal the brokenhearted, to bring liberty to the captives. And we were all captive to something and set those who were in prison free. And I think today we all need some freedom. Amen. Amen. But what, what Kevin pastor told us today was this, that you've got to see yourself differently. If you keep seeing yourself as the old man, as Adam, you're going to be the old man and you'll always have to, you'll be going around the same mountain over and over until you decide to die to the old you and live in newness with Christ and be victorious. You'll have the life that you deserve. Amen. I want to pray pray with you guys. Heavenly Father, we come to you this afternoon. We give you thanks and praise, Lord God. Today's pastor told us a revelation from you, Lord God, that we are the new man, that this covenant is everlasting, that we can't foul it up. You've already did it. It's already done and we receive it, Lord God. But today, Lord God, I pray that your people would see you for who you are, that their belief in you changes their life, that we can't change our behavior, Lord. We must have you, that no longer can it look like a religious thing. We must have your power inside of us. As the Spirit of God, you breathe the life into us and we receive it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray and we all said, Amen. Amen, amen, amen.